Well, it looks like we have a quorum online. We have our speakers ready to go, so we should uh, jump into our activities for this morning. Estou conseguindo conectar. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back to the Council of the Americas, this time virtually. And again, uh, we appreciate uh, that you continue to engage with us in this format. We don't know. My name is Eric Farnsworth. I run the Washington office of the Council of the Americas. Very pleased to be your uh, host for the program this morning, which promises to be a very interesting and timely discussion on Ecuador's response to the COVID crisis and what the government is doing to uh, come back stronger and come back better out of this crisis. This program is part of our healthcare series since early March of this year. Uh, we've hosted numerous meetings featuring senior level officials and experts from around the hemisphere on the regional COVID uh, issues and the response and what governments and the private sector are able to do together to react effectively, as well as for the future implications for regional healthcare systems. And the implications are very significant and they are lasting. As soon as Ecuador was hit by the pandemic, the Ecuadorian government and its Ministry of Public Health took appropriate measures to mitigate the COVID-19 impact. These measures have focused on coordinating joint responses to address social, economic, and health issues in the context of the declaration of the national health emergency, which the Ecuadorian government issued in March. The Minister of Public Health will present the results of several policies aimed uh, at providing health care for everyone in the context of this worldwide crisis, including telemedicine, primary health care engagement, hospital care enhancement, coronavirus testing expansion, and others. So we're in for a real treat this morning. Before we uh, begin the program, I want to thank our healthcare sponsors who have provided very meaningful support to us and allow us to really focus on these issues in a meaningful way. And those sponsors are Medtronic, Merck, Pfizer, Roche, and Sanofi. And their support is very, very much appreciated. I also want to thank Zoe Douth of the Council of the Americas, who coordinates our healthcare activities across the organization, does a great job. And I also want to thank Felicia Now of the University of Miami and Hugo Villegas of Medtronic, who have graciously agreed to serve as the co-chairs of this effort. And we really rely on their expertise and we thank them for their engagement on these activities. Before we ask the minister for his presentation, uh, we are very privileged to have this morning a special guest, but we are going to have the opportunity to host her for a reception just next week, and we'll be able to feature her all on her own. But Ambassador, we are delighted that you're able to join us. And I wonder if you'd uh, give just a couple minutes of uh, introductory comments and welcome for the activities this morning. Thank you, Eric. What a pleasure to be with you and to see you at least <laughs> through the video. And good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to see you all here. We appreciate your attendance to this virtual event. Everything is virtual now. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to the Ambassador to the America Society Council of the Americas and its President Susan Segal for organizing this meeting and to the Ecuadorian Minister of Public Health, Dr. Juan Carlos Ceballos, for sharing with us the public health actions taken by Ecuadorian government along these months. Um, even though Ecuador was one of the first countries in the world to take measures to contain this spread of COVID-19, we have experienced difficult times, suffered painful losses, and seen our economy disrupted. Uh, but the rapid and decisive actions taken by the Ecuadorian government, led by President Lenín Moreno and by Minister Ceballos, has allowed us to reduce the potential effects of this pandemic and to start reopening our economy step by step. I am honored to participate in this event with Minister Ceballos. Ecuador is very, very fortunate to, to have such an amazing person to count us in experience and knowledge as a specialist in epidemiology trained in the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Ceballos has led the Ministry of Public Health of Ecuador since March 21st, and the outcomes of his decisions in the context of financial resource constraints deserve much, much praise. Without further, I give the floor to Minister Ceballos for all of us to benefit of his important remarks, and thank you so much. With that, Minister Ceballos, uh, we would be honored to have your uh, intervention. Over to you. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I am 
a very humble person. Uh, I think I am giving all my best uh, to serve my country. And that is the, the most important motivation that I have to continue working on behalf of, of the people of Ecuador. If you could please allow me to um, start uh, the presentation. Just, just please confirm, Eric, that uh, everybody's um, looking at uh, the, the presentation. Yes, we can see it. It looks good. Thank you. So uh, in the ne next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I, I will uh, summarize what is the current situation of uh, uh, COVID-19 in Ecuador. And um, uh, I have five objectives for this presentation. The, the, the first one is to provide you with a, a, a succinct uh, historical summary. And second, to uh, discuss with you the, some disease indicators and their tendencies and the, the health system impact of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, as the third uh, bullet, I will discuss also the epidemiological strategy. And what has worked with us? Uh, and I put here as a successful um, pearls. And in fourth uh, place, I would discuss the learned experiences and uh, the, what are the next steps. We are dividing the, in, 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 in a summary what happened with the COVID-19 in Ecuador in two periods. The first one, it happened in the cities of uh, Guayaquil and uh, Babahoyo. Those are located in the coast of Ecuador. And uh, from there, between uh, March 15th and March 28th, the, the imported cases, mainly from Spain and Italy, uh, came and spread out as a primary and secondary transmission clusters. And in the second period, that there was a community transmission and an exponential growth. In, uh, of course, in the city of Guayaquil and, uh, and in other uh, surrounding cities that are named in the, in the slide, San Borondon, Daule, Duran, and Milagro. And this occurred between March 29 and April 4. Also, it's very important to uh, uh, notice that which are the contingency measures that uh, we implemented. Uh, February 29, it was uh, um, announced as the patient zero. Uh, nevertheless, we know now that uh, it was actually February 15 when she arrived in Guayaquil, but it was announced officially on uh, February 29th and uh, that this patient moved between the cities of Guayaquil and Babaoyo in the coast, as I said. On March 16th, uh, it was declared the state of emergency uh, and the emergency operation committee took place. Uh, Ecuador was the second country in Latin America to close the airports. And proudly, I say, is the first uh, one in, uh, in most of Latin America to open the international uh, uh, airports back to, back to normal function. This is the most striking figure that I want to share with you. These are the daily deaths that occurred between April and July in Guayaquil. This spike showed that in one day, in one single day, there were 704 deaths in the city. And amazingly, after the, the end of, of April, we have controlled as can be seen in the, in the bottom right hand side of the, of the figure, how we, are, uh, we have controlled this, um, these daily deaths. This is the current situation as September 22nd, and uh, we have uh, 102,000 recovered patients, close to 20,000 hospital discharges, 126,000 confirmed cases, and discarded cases, close to 200,000. We have conducted 389,000 uh, PCR uh, tests, and this is something that I would like to take a, a second or two to, to explain. We have, from patients with confirmed, uh, confirmed cases, 7,301 confirmed cases have died. But we have increased since September 7th 
also probable cases. This is a way to, to um, explain better what is going on in, in Ecuador without hiding the deaths. What is the age and sex distribution in national data? You can see that it's slightly higher among men and 60%, close to 60% are younger people between 20 to 49 uh, years old. Very few are less than four years old. This map uh, also uh, sh shows the community cases by province. We have Pichincha where Quito is located. We have Guayas where um, uh, Guayaquil is located. And uh, as, as far as, as September the 22nd, and I want to, to also share with you that this kind of data, as well as these deaths per 100,000 population by province, uh, are very useful for the local governments or the municipalities to take actions, public health containment, and so on. This uh, tendency, this curve, uh, this trend uh, shows that deaths in, in Ecuador by date of death. Again, these are only COVID-19 cases that have a, 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 a been uh, shown to have a, a positive test. And as, as you can see, and that's why the numbers are slightly lower than what I, I showed you before, but also how we have able to contain the curve. And this is the last day of, uh, of September the 22nd. Another way to see uh, how are we uh, taking care of the pandemic is to see the effective reproduction number, RO or RO, or also it's called the, the, the um, RE in, in Spanish, but it is the, the, the way that people can transmit the disease. I have chosen a few of the provinces of Ecuador, those that are very highly affected, and as you can see, See here, for example, let's say one is, is, is Manabi here, or I'm sorry, Asuay here, where Cuenca is located, and is, it was as high as four in the very first, um, um, in, in, in the week of April, March to April, and then it is slightly coming down. This kind of, uh, of, of more um, curves going up, we're going to see from now and on. But it is important also to notice the tendency to slow down this uh, uh, contagious, uh, the, 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 the contagious of the, of, the, of the reproductive number. Also, this is an, an extraordinary graph that, that shows the comparison between in the same months between March and June, and in the previous years, 2015, 2016, 17, and so on, and 2020. See, here are all deaths, close to 20,000 deaths in this brief period, and that corresponds mainly to Guayaquil and Babaoyo, the two cities that I mentioned before. But after that, later on, how we have been able to control this is also important to know. These are the extra deaths that occurred in, in Ecuador during this period of time. Proudly, this is the cumulative confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million people. And as you, we can see here, here is Ecuador, a very flat line, and as compared to other countries in the region. Purposely, I put September 5th, because as I mentioned before, we um, changed the, the data and added in September the, the 7th, also probable cases, not only the concurrent ones. What is the impact of the health sector? First of all, disease in the health professionals that took care of them. Increase in deaths by the coronary, coronary virus, as, as you can imagine, I showed to you 20,000 in a very brief period of time. Drastic reduction in usual attention, substantial reduction, in health promotion and disease prevention that we should be focusing on without the pandemic, increase in referral of patients on public health network to private health network, and vice versa. This is important. For the first time, the public health sector was, was um, uh, admitting patients from the private sector to our public health sector. 
going on, the increase in infrastructure and equipment. I will talk a little bit more on, on detail on that. Increasing the capacity of public laboratories, uh, the technology updates on three response systems, and the increasing in hospital emergency care. What was the strategy that we implemented? First of all, and most important, is strengthening the primary health sector. We're at the community level. Expansion of the hospital capacity, active surge of COVID-19 cases, in an investment of $219 million for the health sector devoted exclusively for the pandemic, and telemedicine training uh, for health personnel. We have a shortage of personnel uh, in terms of intensivists, pneumologists, and everything. And now we have in uh, uh, primary health uh, physicians taking care of COVID patients. Let's go one by one, strengthening the primary health sector. We enable all these medical consultants, uh, consultancies, the 353, more than 800,000 attentions to vulnerable and priority patients, more than 800 external consultations, 345,000 emergency care for respiratory disease only during this period of the pandemic. Secondly, the increase of hospital capacity. 142 hospitals now uh, take care of, um, of COVID-19 patients. 52,000 health professionals work for only for the Ministry of Health. And we have contracted more than 2,000 health professionals for the emergency services along during the pandemic. Also, uh, this shows the increase of beds. 1,117 beds only for hospitalization and 328 for intensive care units. This is an increase of more than twice beds and 2.5 uh, to 3 point more uh, intensive care units. The third point is the community surveillance that we use as a strategy. Active surveillance. We went after the cases and we did that in order to provide early detection of the cases. Isolation in cases and management of COVID-19, but in collaboration, in collaboration with the community. The preparation of health services, the improvement of health services capacity in all the small, tiny uh, uh, outpatient clinics all over the country. Communication and multi-sectorial and sectorial uh, coordination. That is very important because we incorporated all community servers, community leaders, and uh, uh, in, introduced several other plans to engage the community as part of their responsibility to contain the, the surveillance. And of course, we we also uh, conducted a follow-up of the contacts of patients that uh, were deceased. We did a lot in terms of identification of vulnerable po populations, strengthening the medical del barrio strategy that, that was um, was a, a big push for that. Households in poverty, in extreme poverty, senior citizens, children with disabilities. We paid a lot of attention to indigenous uh, populations, Afro-Ecuadorian, Montuvio, and other minority children and adolescents, and uh, uh, persons of productive age who became unemployed, unfortunately, or informally employed. Children, youth, and women victims of domestic violence. In the, in, in the fourth strategy was the diagnostic tests. We did not conduct massive testing. What we did is limited because of several reasons. One is the access to the RT-PCR tests and also tests for antigens and antibodies. What we did do is the smart sectorization, as this map shows. We obtained probabilistic samples and conducted every test at a health survey in a georeferenciation, as you can see in the graph here. This is an example of the probabilistic sample. Now, in Quito, we know that 22%, one of every five um, individuals, 18 and older, has had the disease and has developed antibodies, approximately uh, 370,000 people. Lessons learned, joint work. We need to work more and we need to work with the city halls open these spaces, private companies, the private sector, the, 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 the general community. 
the primary health activation system, but I, I don't have words to repeat that once again and again. Telemedicine, we train staff training, uh, uh, staff personnel for uh, 38 hospitals and probabilistic samples instead of massive uh, uh, conduction of, of uh, testing. And the international cooperation, which is essential. We just came from uh, a Charité in Berlin, and uh, this person that is behind me, Christian Drosner, is one of the, the, the patients who discovered SARS-1. We have a strong correlation with them. What are the next steps? We want to move on and on and doing what is the, 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 the up-to-date surveillance system, genomic surveillance. We have detected and, 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 and characterize certain viruses specific for ECHO in collaboration with Germany. This is the multiple introductions of SARS-CoV-2 in Latin America, and these are three of the four viruses that are specific and that, that have mutated in, in ECHO. Why is it so important to do this? It's important for the development of vaccines, because we want those viruses to be part of the vaccine and also because of diagnostic tests. Diagnostic tests during the very first five or six days of when, 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 the, when the person is, is, uh, has, has, uh, has been exposed to, to a case and we don't know if the patient is, uh, has an active uh, virus or not. So a very timely and, 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 and uh, diagnostic test is essential and that's what we are working on in, in the, with international collaboration. Let me allow me to finish my presentation. This is the last slide with a thought. This pandemic is a health an economic, and, and, and more than anything, a social pandemic. It should not be solved inside the hospital. We, we, we cannot do that. We must control at the community level and work with the community in order to have a co-responsibility in order to, to, to stop this disease. Thank you so much for your attention. Mr. Minister, thank you very much uh, for that outstanding presentation. Um, really, really good and provides confidence, I think, to those of us who uh, have seen what's going on across the region that you and your team are really on top of the situation to the extent possible. So congratulations, thank you. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate that presentation. We have about 15 minutes for interaction with uh, folks on the line and we have several questions. I'm not going to take them necessarily in the order in which they came in because several of them are similar in nature. So uh, we're going to jump around a little bit, but let's get going. Uh, with our first question, uh, which is going to be, hold on just a second. I had it here and I lost it. Ah, here we go. It's uh, going to be from Erica Pagani. Erica, uh, I think you're already on the camera. Hi, Minister. Hi, uh, Ambassador Baki. Uh, you were showing great information, the RO uh, field. I just wonder if uh, how can we get that level of detail, detailed information, so we can make the appropriate decisions and to protect our colleagues and collaborate with the, with the community protection, as, as the minister was was saying. Uh, I, we are at, the, at this moment as evaluating the, the 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 go back of our or of our colleagues, and it would be very good to have this level of uh, this granularity of information. I don't know if they are available. Uh, yes, Erica. Thanks for the for the question. They are available. I, I think that we we we, we can provide you uh, a lot of um, um, how do I say uh, some some suggestions in order to, to manage. Every institution needs to manage individually, of course, individually, the, the access and the return and and b b because in every institution the number of people that might continue to do uh, uh, teleworking. Uh, uh, or distant working is is needs to be assessed. But yes, the, the RO or or the, the rate of, of contagious disease it can, can be provided. Uh, however, this is this is done actually by an external source. We do not provide that 
and and we do it uh, in terms of the, the, the general public, the general uh, provinces, uh, and also in, at the national level. But we will be more than as we did in the airports, as we're planning to do with the schools. If you provide order, structure, distance. And we conduct, you conduct pilot in the study and do it in a in, in, in a smart way locally. I think it it has to be done in a successful way. That that this is extremely important because um, and and that's our that our experience as I said in the airports and in, in some of the pilot schools that we have conducted and in the returning of of the uh, industry, for example, in the agro industry, pharmacies, supermarkets, and everything. I have yes. been proud to say, Erica, let me take this opportunity to say that I was surprised in my recent visit to Europe that the Ecuadorians were more formally uh, and, and disciplined than the Germans. And that was a, a, a surprise. We, we had 18,000 people protesting in Berlin <laughs> before we arrived on Sunday. That was a Saturday against the measures. You don't see that here. We have 99.9% .9 of people in the whole country, in, in, in Ecuador, with masks. We need and to work on other measures, of course, but that, that's it. Thanks, thanks, Eric. I'm taking too well, long thank to, you. To, thank to, you. to answer. Those are precisely the questions that are facing all of us, not just Ecuador. So, Erica, I wanted to start with your question because it's a universal question for yes. one of us. Yeah, indeed. So, well done. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go to Nelson Baldeon from uh, Schlumberger. Nelson, to you. Of all, I want to congratulate for all your efforts and assume that position in very tough times. And the question uh, specifically is, uh, we are in the oil sector. We are worried about the uh, uh, provinces of Sucumbios and Orellana. Which is the measures that you, you are taking with the minister, ministry to try to avoid the infections in that area and try to keep the oil production stable? Sorry, Nelson, could, could you repeat a little bit louder it, it, the, the, the speaker? I, I couldn't hear the last part of your question. Okay, the thing is that uh, we are following very closely the infections in the areas of Orellana and um, Sucumbios, where is the oil fields. Mm -hmm. And we want to know about the measures that you are taking with the ministry to try to keep safe that the population and the oil workers to try to avoid the infections and try for us to keep uh, save the oil production in that areas. Oh, okay, so I think again, what I described during my presentation, it's essential to have the participation of the community. The individuals that live in the in, in Oredana Sucumbias need to be part and, and be and be co-responsible with that, uh, with the measures. We don't have we don't have any new things to share uh, than uh, what occurred and that was implemented in the 14th century, 673 years ago in during the, 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 the Black Death, or in Spanish, La Plaga Negra. Mm -hmm. 670, we implemented the same measures, distancing, masks, and, and probably stay at home. We, we haven't improved that. And we, if we do not have a an international setting as this one in order to discuss things, we, we won't progress. And there will, it will pass 673 more years and we will recommend to the general population the same thing. It's very sad. In Oredana, in Sucumbios, um, we're working with, with the communities, with the local community, with the national community, in a way that uh, they can, again, be responsible for their actions, and also uh, improving the, um, several of the, of the health uh, centers there, in particular in Oredana. So we have trained the, the, the personnel and we have expanded the, the intensive care unit uh, beds capacity in that sector. So uh, again, uh, we also have a, a plan with Petro Ecuador and, uh, and Petro Amazonas in order to uh, improve uh, measures and, and to, to enhance uh, uh, the, uh, the active surveillance, meaning that the, the, the location of uh, active cases and, uh, uh, and, and also the, the, the 
contacting the, the relatives or, or, or people that live with them. So we, we do have a plan on that, and I will be more than happy to hear your, your experiences and suggestions that you have in, in particular for that uh, uh, population. Thank you, dear minister, for your kind explanation that uh, uh, j just from your knowledge, we are the biggest oil service company in the in the world. Um, we have a, our, our priority is the, is the safety of the people. And uh, in that way, if uh, we can contact directly with the minister, the ministry, with the person that you assigned, it will be a pleasure to 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 follow all these uh, your kindly comments and try to work together with you with our people. We have uh, almost two thousand people in the in the in the in the fields, and and we is a pleasure to try to save all of them in coordination with your ministry. This the. Uh tension between the economy and the healthcare needs of the population is fundamental to what all of us are facing. And our next question from Carlos Albuja is going to uh, ask that uh, question. Carlos, we'll go to you. And then after you, we'll go to Stephen Arisaga and Felicia now. Uh, and I think that will probably be our roster in the time that we have available. So Carlos, to you, please. Carlos, are you with us? Uh, well, uh, in case not, uh, Mr. Minister, let me ask the question that uh, he had posed uh, because it is a fundamental one. Um, the question is, to the extent there is a second wave of cases, uh, does the government have contingency plans to shut down the economy again or take steps on the economic side. Perhaps that's a little bit out of your mandate. So uh, if you have a comment on that, please feel free. If you don't, that's okay too. But but that's the nature of the question, uh, the the uh, tension between the economic side and the healthcare side. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Eric, and thanks, uh, Carlos, for that question. You, you, you cannot solely think in this pandemic as a health problem again. It is, a, it is an economic, a financial problem, and it's most of everything is a social problem. So yes, um, many more waves will come, but the key point is that these waves need to be contained at the primary health sector level. And uh, to do that, we need to improve uh, our communication with the surveillance, with the, with the community, and things that we active surveillance and things that we have already discussed. But also, it is important to prioritize which are the, the sectors that need more care in terms of, uh, for example, as I said, agricultural, um, everything that deal, needs uh, deals with food, food chain, and everything to sustain that. So we need to put a lot of emphasis on that. Supermarkets, um, pharmacies, the health personnel needs needs to be active. And to do that, in order to activate, the, the, there must be an, a balance between the activation of the uh, economic uh, sector, uh, prioritizing, as I said, those 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 um, those uh, those sectors, and uh, and and also measuring the risk. Of uh, of the of the of, of this interaction, um, if we do in a in a in a order, the structured way, I think that we can minimize. We cannot avoid more waves, but we can minimize the sanitary structure and uh, the the investment that we have done in the sanitary sector, in the health sector. It is extremely important. We if the waves, as we have done in Ecuador since uh, since June, perhaps May in the whole system, in the whole country. If we contain at that at the primary level, I think that new waves may appear, but we can control them, we can contain them. What, what we don't want is the spike that I presented as, I think that's slide number five, this extraordinary spike that occurred, unfortunately, in Guayaquil. And that was a lesson that we learned very carefully and say, no, this cannot be happening again. Thank you. Stephen, to you, Stephen Arisaga. Thank you very much, Eric. Minister Ceballos, first of all, thank you very much for your actions and leadership during this pandemic. Moving into the question, 
A few months ago, you suggested that up to 60% of Ecuadorians would probably become infected with COVID-19. But zooming into Quito today, we see that the sample suggests around 22% have had the virus, judging by the presence of antibodies. Does this mean that we are far away from the peak in the capital city, or has the projected percentage of infected people happily decreased? Thank you, Stephen. That, that is a very important, and thanks for thanking me. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it has been my pleasure. It has been hard, but truly, uh, I, I am proud of, of committed my time and, and my effort to, 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 to try to contain this pandemic. Um, yes, I, I, I did say that based on the very first uh, data that we had from, from China. And they projected that in 120 days, the uh, 60% of the population will be um, uh, exposed to the virus, con uh, be exposed to the, to the virus, and perhaps uh, also develop some some uh, um, immunity for that. But that was uh, taken into account without thinking that we would be able to contain that to improve the, the, the primary health sector and to divide, for example, in every single center to uh, flows of patients, one for infected diseases, infectious diseases, respiratory disease, and the usual care. And uh, what we have done is try to spread that 60% in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wider timeline. Later, we, we spread that so that we have a very limited sanitary health system capacity. We, we have a, a, a very limited in, that in, in terms of, of uh, personnel, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of ventilators, in terms of medicines, and so on. So if we contain that and spread that over time, I think that, and that strategy that we use is a, a, a useful one. Uh, yes, Quito is about 22%, as I showed you, in a, in a very carefully designed probabilistic example. But Guayaquil probably is 33%. And we have um, data from uh, Esmeraldas, the province in the, in the northern coastal part of Ecuador, that is around 43%. So uh, it changes from place to place. Populations react differently. Uh, I hope that we don't reach that 60% because the death toll in order to have that level of, 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 of confirmed cases is too high and too costly in terms of deaths. So hopefully we will continue to contain and, 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 and have these small waves that spread all over time until the vaccine arrives. And probably we will have that, perhaps the first two doses will come early in, in, in next year, the first semester of, of next year, hopefully. Uh, but I, I'm a skeptic about that. And we can discuss further that. Minister, thank you. We are at time. I think hopefully we can squeeze in one additional question, but just to alert you that we have several questions from people who are asking um, to make sure, please, that the ministry is aware that the private sector is very interested in working together uh, with you and your team to find solutions, to uh, lend their expertise, to add value to the efforts that you are doing, uh, and to be a real partner in this effort uh, to the extent it's convenient for you and your team. But just there are several uh, questions like that, so it is a priority, and I wanted to raise that with you. Um, let's go to our final uh, question. Uh, I'm sorry we just don't have additional time, but uh, Felicia, to you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, Senor Ministro, Dr. Ceballos, Embajadora, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, on behalf of the University of Miami, and I speak for our Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas, but also President Julio Frank, who you know has been in a position of having to, um, at the, the difficult position of being minister as well, but not in this level of pandemic. Um, estamos a sus órdenes. Uh, I'm sure we'll discuss that, and I want to be able to discuss that later. Um, I had a, a couple of questions more from my um, position as a global health um, researcher and some of the research that we're doing. But just before I do that, to, to truly to, to have a moment to congratulate you. I've seen um, several ministers present 
um, on this topic and on others. And this is one of the most professional and uh, serious from an academic point of view, as well as a public health policy point of view presentations I have ever seen. And I've seen I've seen many. So thank you very much. And, uh, and, and I mean that not only from the political and policy point of view, but also um, as someone who works in the field. There were three questions, but I know we won't have time for all three. I'll, I'll throw them out thinking that perhaps one um, might be, be possible. Uh, the first is around this very high rate of mask use. Um, we've seen the Facebook data. I've been reviewing that, the data that the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation are also using. And those rates across Latin America are so high. Even when I've been um, analyzing some of the surveys, like the ones that Cesar Victor has for, for Brazil, um, they're, they're almost unbelievably high. Um, and we've been trying to understand that better. The second is, how do you feel about the use of the indicator of the positivity rate? I know it's a double-edged sword, um, but has been helping us primarily in, in other countries to think about whether or not testing is being done appropriately, um, as well as to see how the, to some extent, how the virus is progressing. And the final, I might talk about this later, is we've been very interested across uh, the region in the subnational policy response, particularly in countries where there's been a failed national policy response, which is not the case in Ecuador. But I'm I'm curious as to whether or not you've got some variance in the subnational policy. And thank you again, Neil Gracias. Oh, eh, gracias, Felicia. I, 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 I missed it in part Miami also, you know, that I was at FIU and I worked with Dr. Sacco and to the Frank. To Miami anytime, why go so far as Germany? <laughs> Ministro, aquí le esperamos. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I have a son living in Miami, also studying medicine, so there are many, many tights and, and, and good memories. But uh, Eric, let me allow me, please, to, to, to share with you, yeah, uh, the, the, the solution for this pandemic cannot be done from the government or uh, point of view solely. We need academia. We, we do need, we need to work with the private sector. We must work with the private sector. And in Ecuador, we have had an extraordinary uh, experience uh, with uh, several fideicomisos that, uh, that really work uh, with uh, generosity never seen before. And, uh, and I think that we should continue learning, and, 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 and I am absolutely open to, to this, not only to the community, at the community level, and, and but also the private sector. The private the private sector must um, 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 give and provide suggestions, and, and we must work together in order to, as early as possible, exit this this pandemic. Um, and and Felicia, uh, going back to to your your question, yes, that that positivity in the testing and um, and rate must be included in all the the decisions for them. For the central government point of view, uh, we provide at, at the local level as much information as possible because are they 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 know better than anybody in their populations. I'm, I'm talking about small municipalities or, or governments at the local level. They know their population. They know the limits, the strengths, and we must work with them in order to improve and strengthen the collaboration and and provide the indicators in order for them with us with the central government to make the decisions so yeah the 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 the, um, the positivity rate is one of them uh, and the other is the the importance of continue testing the population but in an order in an intelligent way uh, that's why we in every single uh, step what we do at the, at, the, at the community level is to have a health survey a small one, but a health survey that can use that can be used for us. And the second one is the test itself, which test PCR mainly, but in 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 in, in Quito, the twenty two percent, for example, was done with not PCRs, but done with antibodies because we want to see what is the serum prevalence of, of, of the of the population. And third, the geo referenciation, we were able to locate the houses of every of every single person that was contagious or had a a positive PCR, saving all the confidentiality. They were done only by the army, managed by the army and everything. 
and to, to solve this part of the that very sensitive part of um, the, the confidentiality. But if you add the health server, the testing itself, and the zero differentiation, you can locate the cases and, and, and act with the municipalities and the local governments on that regard. I would be more than happy, Felicia, to have a, an, another conversation and, and to answer more of your of, of your concerns about that, because I think that's the way to do it. This, this, this forum serves for that. So you have my contact, let's talk about it. I'd be honored. And uh, there's some research I want to tell you about and how we might possibly do some collaboration, but estamos a sordens. Well, unfortunately, we are beyond the allotted time for our public program, so we're going to have to call a close to it. I know that there is a lot more interest, uh, Minister, to uh, continue the collaboration with you. So uh, bearing in mind what you just said, perhaps we can uh, get you back to the Council of the Americas at some point for an update. Uh, but uh, when the ambassador introduced you, she said that you were essentially a national treasure of Ecuador. And I think after this uh, performance and your presentation today, I think I would concur with that, and probably everybody online would as well. I want to thank our sponsors again for the series uh, support. I want to thank Felicia for her uh, leadership of the initiative, along with Hugo Villegas. I want to thank Susan Siegel, the president and CEO, who is on the line as well. Madam Ambassador, we look forward to hosting the reception for you next week. Uh, I could go on and on, uh, but uh, we don't have the time. Mr. Minister, thank you again. Uh, and this concludes the public portion of our program.